Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Faith Forum. Uh, my name is Chip Edens, and I'm the rector of Christ Church, and I welcome you to this uh, forum that has been going on for many years where we have important conversations about life and the connection between faith and life and what we're called to do as Christians as we seek to live out our faith in this world. Today our conversation is about children, about America's children, and the challenges that our children face uh, for many reasons. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be talking about the impact that uh, the pandemic has had on our children. Uh, the, our ministry um, into the city of Charlotte has continued all throughout the pandemic, but we have been limited by our uh, no contact policy of being able to go into schools and have uh, conversations, be able to, to mentor, uh, to tutor. Um, we've been limited by uh, these factors. And uh, we now think uh, that we have a window coming our way. We hope it'll be a, a door that will we'll bust open and we'll be able to really fully engage. But I think it's helpful for us first uh, to take stock of where we are. And there's no uh, better person to help us think about children than the Reverend Dr. Starsky Wilson, who's the CEO of the Children's Defense Fund. Uh, from its inception, the Children's Defense Fund has challenged the United States to raise its standards by improving policies and programs for children. Over the years, uh, we have seen this extraordinary organization do uh, critical research about, uh, can you, are you ready for this? The survival of children. The survival of children. Their protection the, and their development in all racial and income groups for independent analysis across federal and state policies in order to advocate for children and for their families. Uh, one of, uh, the Children's Defense Fund has a number of programs, but one of those that we're familiar with is Freedom Schools. It was launched in 1993 as an enrichment program for reading. They also have a program called Beat the Odds that hosts awareness and awards partial schol college scholarships. And they have a youth advocacy uh, and leadership training program. These are just some of many pro things that the Children's Defense Fund is engaged in. They have a new leader in Dr. Starsky Wilson, who is himself uh, a pastor, an activist, a researcher, an organizational leader, and a, most especially a father, who uh, has his own unique story to tell uh, that has informed his work and his leadership. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Starsky Wilson to Christ Church. Um, Starsky, I want to read a passage of scripture, and I just want to get you to speak into this. And every now and again, when I feel like I got to bring out the heavy stuff from the Bible, I like to do it from the King James Version. And this is in Dallas, it's where we learn scripture. Yeah. It's King James. King, you, it, it, you grew up in, with, with King James Version, you said. Yeah. You all can hear him okay? All right. Yeah. We need to turn him up a little bit because he's he you don't need to hear from me. You need to hear from him today. So let's just go ahead and uh, get you to uh, say a few more things. Make sure we can hear you. Sure. I, I was sharing that I grew up in Texas where God speaks in the King James. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. <laughs> From the Gospel of Matthew, the 19th chapter, the 14th verse, Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. What was Jesus saying? Yeah, I think a couple of quick really important things. First, uh, who's Jesus speaking to? Um, the disciples, those who have spent most time with him, uh, are standing between him and desperate parents who have heard something about this guy named Jesus, 
um, such that they believe that if he interacted with their children, then the circumstances for their lives would be better. In the context of short life expectancy, um, they didn't expect um, their children in this context to get old enough to have gray hair. Uh, the disciples represent a continuum. get out the way. And I like what he says after this as well. As he takes them up into his arms and blesses them, and touches them, um, he suggests, he says explicitly, um, that if you do not enter the kingdom as a little child, you shall not be able to enter it. He goes further than saying get out of their way because they need to get to me, because their lives can be changed, because the expectancy and hope that their parents have is rightly placed with me. He actually goes further and teaches a little lesson to his disciples and says, hey, they, they are now an object lesson for you. If you don't take the posture that they have, then the project that we've been up to, the preaching of the kingdom of heaven, shall not be yours. In this, Jesus places the hopes for the kingdom that he has been preaching, that he has been declaring, that he has been manifesting and giving glimpses of to these disciples on children. And so in many ways, uh, while uh, Marion Wright Edelman is an absolutely powerful and iconic leader whom uh, I shudder to follow at the Children's Defense Fund, this church is built as part of a children's movement that has been occurring, manifesting, and growing since the speaking of that passage of scripture or since the calling of that youth group that we call the disciples. Jesus is saying, we're starting a children's movement. So let's place them in the center and let's manifest what God desires. Hmm. Tell us about your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I grew up not far from Virginia, who, who welcomed me today. Uh, Virginia grew up uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, I grew up uh, rivaling Fort Worth uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and, uh, and I grew up in many ways in church. Uh, I grew up, I, I like to tell people who I meet across the way that I grew up actually in Dallas. Uh, Dallas is a large metroplex, and most people I meet outside of Dallas are from some of that surrounding kind of um, developed area. I grew up in the city limits in the north. Uh, I'm sorry, in the southwest side of Dallas in a place called Oak Cliff, um, and came of age in the 1980s uh, and early 90s uh, when the Children's Defense Fund was doing something called um, the Black Community Crusade for Children in response to very high uh, teen pregnancy rates, uh, to violence in communities and in neighborhoods, including um, gun violence. Uh, and all of those elements touched my life and my nuclear family uh, even though, to be very clear, where I grew up is in the church. Uh, I grew up in Union Missionary Baptist Church in Oak Cliff. I grew up in Beth Eden Baptist Church in Oak Cliff. And for a short term, uh, I, because I'm Baptist and Baptist multiply by dividing, um, <laughs> I spent a couple of years in a church plant um, because there had been a split in one of our churches. And, uh, and our family uh, went to uh, follow our pastor in that uh, planting work. Um, Praises of Zion was the name of that church. Um, and, so, um, and so that's where I grew up. I grew up coming to Sunday school. I grew up with a mother who was uh, the leader of the Baptist Training Union, who was, a youth, who was the youth director. We didn't have things called youth ministers. The youth director was like somebody's mama, right, who just like took on responsibility for us. Uh, so I grew up in the church, but I also grew up with all of those challenges of what it meant uh, to live uh, in an urban community, uh, in a black community in the 1990s, right? So... Um, so my older brother uh, and my youngest uncle were taken from us uh, by community violence in the same neighborhood uh, around my grandparents' house. They were um, murdered. Both, both murdered. Um, my um, three sisters are all uh, teen moms. Uh, and, um, and I wrestled with what those challenges are as well. Um, we all came from the same household, same um, same upbringing, uh, same churches, uh, same realities, um, and so much of what happens for children is about chance. Where were we born? Where were we situated? But also, at what points were we situated 
in what way. My mother um, was an employee, uh, kind of longtime employee at what was then Southwestern Bell, became SBC, became AT&T. And so the other place I grew up, place matters to me, was in the four bell towers. There are four large bell towers there uh, in downtown Dallas. Uh, we spent a lot of time there because my mom was involved with victims outreach and she was involved with the Citizens Committee to Save Our Children and she was involved uh, with the Telephone Pioneers, which is his own kind of uh, group there uh, from Southwestern Bell. Uh, and what I recognize is that because I am a middle child, dun, 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 <laughs> um, the third of five, um, I happen to be in the most formative connecting years for my future when the family was at its most stable financial point. When I was in middle school, when I was making the connections that, you know, and I was old enough to stick with them through high school, um, people who were already headed to college, even though my mother didn't go to college, uh, people who had the assumption because their families were educators and the like, that just got embedded in me and it was a little more sticky with me and with the sister who came just after me who went to college uh, but hadn't finished. Um, so that first year was the time she came and joined me in New Orleans. She went to Loyola when I was at Xavier, but it was tougher for her to stick and stay uh, than for me. So I take with me um, this reality that movements that are happening in organizations like the Children's Defense Fund should respond to real life issues and real households like CDF did to mine, even though I didn't know CDF and CDF didn't know me. Uh, and the fact that there's a little bit of chance in this. And so part of what our responsibility is, is, is to change the context, the chances and the opportunities around children as much as we intervene to support one here or there. I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, your family more if we could and that's just we've been talking a lot about wellness here mm -hmm. and so often when we talk about poor vulnerable families we we sort of we just think of things in purely economic terms we're beginning to to think of things more and more around around matters of race and history um, but I want to look I just want to use the lens of wellness mm -hmm. for your family and I'm just really I'm struck by all the things that must have gone on in your house mm -hmm. uh, and how that impacted your family. So say more about your, your you, you've spoken about your mother. What about your father? Yeah. What, what, what role did he play in the family? Yeah, I last, um, I last held space with my father when I was three years old. Wow. Um, and as I understand, he's still living. Uh, Every now and then I think about going to find him. Um, frankly, I have more agency in that than he does, as I understand um, mm -hmm. the trajectory of this situation. And my mom has wondered when I was gonna, like I'd ask um, in my adult life, and she said, I wonder when you were going to. Is he in prison? Uh, no, he's no. not. Mm -hmm. um, nor did I, do I understand that he ever has been. Yeah. Um, but my mother made a decision at one point that it would be better uh, for me and for us yeah. um, that he not be present. Uh, and um, and so uh, I, I, I trust that decision uh, was the right one, uh, and I trust that there's things happening around my life at that time uh, yeah. that I didn't understand. I also realized how much this had to do with, not that this is my story, but yeah. I, I'll tell you something I came to understand later, this, the agency of, of my mom or, or the challenge uh, of making these kinds of decisions. Um, when I, I spent the last 20 years before coming to Washington, D.C. in late 2020 in St. Louis. Uh, and in St. Louis, uh, it became um, a heart in ways we think of Chicago and, uh, and the ways we think of Cabrini Green. In St. Louis, uh, there was a, a, a housing project called Pruitt Igo. Uh, and it was when we were going through that social experiment in America about stacking poverty. Uh, concentrating in one area, both people who were poor and resources. Uh, but then we also had housing policy that impacted some of the life decisions that people made. Um, so you have policy that suggests that if there is uh, a, a two-parent household, a man in the house, then supports that are received by the family are reduced from a government standpoint because they should be able to stand on their own. Um, but then 
economic opportunities for those parents, uh, in, in this case many times the fathers, uh, don't match what the subsidies match. And then we have this, a sense of what masculinity means, a sense of what head of household means that is tied economically. And so if you earn $10,000 and the subsidy is $12,000 and your responsibility is to take care of your kids, does taking care of your kids economically look more like staying around or going? And so there's this creation of a moral quagmire uh, for ethical decision making and ethics become so uniquely contextual. Mm -hmm. And so I don't question the decision that, you know, was made by my parents about my future. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, I, you know, I, I don't know what my dad was up to. Um, you know, it's a difficult decision people make about divorce. I, I don't know what my dad was up to. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I trust my mama. Yes. <laughs> well, well, I want to, you know, we're going to talk about Americans' children, but I think your story is, a, is an, an important one um, because I think it does for us what, what we all need, and that is to, to go from uh, maybe what we assume about fa families uh, as, again, poor um, and, all, and some of the, some of the, the other things that are assigned to, you know, people that are poor don't work hard enough, they, you know, they're lazy, you know, uh, on and on and on, um, to really pulling back from all these assumptions and really just talking about a family, you yeah. know, and I'm just thinking about, and I'm a pastor, so I got to think about, you know, I think about people and families, so I'm just trying to imagine again, you, you know, your parents divorce, your, your mother is working hard, you're in a, you know, a, a rough, uh, a rough but beautiful, you know, part of Dallas, um, and, uh, you know, in a, in a church, you, you have a brother who's murdered, uh, you have sisters, you know, that has, who are teen mothers, and, and there's a lot going on there, yeah. right, and so, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if I may say, uh, on a on a your your best day or your worst day, it maybe doesn't draw close to a, a best day uh, from a it, from a stability socioeconomic financial standpoint. And to think about having that as a reality, um, that's a that's something to hold hold in our hearts. Um, you know, and I and I guess I just want to say that um, because I, you know, I share with you I had a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a kind of a rough childhood as well. And you know, had it not been for the intervention of a lot of people, I could have I could have spun out. Um, and yet I'm I'm also a white man, and you're a black man, yeah. and you know, and so um, I, I I'm interested in your family's story of your journey to Dallas, your family's journey to Dallas. When you, when you look back on your, on your roots and your history, how did your family get to Dallas? Yeah, so my family's from uh, East Texas. Interesting um, story. So uh, my, um, my grandfather and um, his brother married my, who were both uh, military men, uh, both um, served the US military, um, married my grandmother and her sister. Uh, you know, you know. Once, once someone had done the research that this was a good family, like why waste all that R and D? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so they 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 um, uh, met. They were from East Texas, uh, so rural part of Texas, uh, and a place where we returned every uh, summer for family reunions and the like. Um, uh, first on a big old lot under a big old tree near the old church with the with the graveyard behind it. Uh, and then we, you know, kind of moved up in the world, and there was a big jubilee center that they that they built. Uh, so it tells you a little bit about uh, 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 how we explored and understood family, but but grounded in this um, a couple of things. Number one, a really solid ethic about uh, discipline uh, from uh, my grandfather and my uncle Norman, uh, and uh, and them kind of making that journey. Uh, but then also a significant sense of place. I talk about place being important for me. 
Um, in my uh, high school years, I spent a couple of years living with my grandfather. And by this time, my grandmother, uh, Lorreen, had um, passed away. Uh, my youngest uncle uh, had been lost. He had been the last child in the house with them. And my grandfather uh, was uh, living alone, alone. Uh, and for health reasons and the like, it just didn't make sense for him to be alone. And so I went and spent uh, time living there with him. One of the things uh, he would always say to me, uh, an enduring voice in, in my life, uh, but also one of those people you attribute wisdom to. So I'm going to invite everyone into this. This is something I do. I hope you do it too. When I can't remember who said something that's really wise, I have a few people that I attribute it to. Um, <laughs> Um, like if it's about the Christian church, uh, if it's about powerful things in the community, if it's about our hope in Christ, and I can't remember which preacher said it, it was probably Gardner Taylor. Um, uh, and in my life, these kind of truisms of wisdom come from my, my grandfather, R.L. Turner. Not, I thought at some point R.L. meant something. No, his name was R.L. <laughs> yeah, R.L. Yeah, Turner. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he taught me things like uh, if you... Um, if you own a truck, you're never out of work, so every man needs a truck. Uh, he he thought, taught me things like, you never sell a car that's paid for. At some point, it may be cheaper to fix this one than it is to pay the note on that one. Uh, and, uh, and he also taught me there are only three things you gotta do in life. Find your place, get in your place, and stay in your place. Uh, he reinforced that at times when I seem to be slightly out of my place, uh, or speaking above my teenage self, you understand? Um, but from him came this, um, this sense of discernment of vocation, right? It's part of what I took from that, uh, and a grounding in history. So I, I think I come from deep wells of wisdom, um, these kind of oracles of practical knowledge uh, that are tied to what it means to um, wrestle in a rural setting, have hope of progress um, that sometimes means coming to an urban setting, uh, and also the reality of toil that may not produce. My mother called my grandmother the most educated domestic in the state of Texas. She had a degree from Jarvis Christian College uh, and she cleaned people's homes in Highland Park. Um, not far from where my grandfather, after the military, became a cook and a chef in Highland Park cafeterias. Uh, I was talking um, to uh, my worship mate in Virginia this morning uh, who has family in Wyoming. Um, I said, Texas and Wyoming, that's the Cheney commute. Um, uh, and I know that because uh, Highland Park is where the Cheneys and the Bushes lived uh, in the Dallas metropolitan area. Uh, and so those are the folks that I ran around in the backs and the rugs in their houses when I went to work with my grandmother during the summers because she's the one who cared for us. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense also that the best of her preparation, the best of her education, and that intellect was cleaning people's houses. Mm -hmm. There's a certain hum humility that comes with that. There's a certain dedication to hard work and ethic that comes with that. But there's also a sense of the resilience of inequity. That even the best narratives that we have shared with ourselves over the years about education being the passport to a better life is not quite as sticky for black people in America who work hard, who are wise, who educate themselves, who are humble and who are faithful. These are my grandparents. These are my uncle and aunt. This is my mama. Um, and yet, my story looks exceptional, even among my siblings who share the same heritage. Mm -hmm. And I'm no better, no smarter, I work no harder than any of them. Mm -hmm. Chance. We have talked about your family. Again, I'm, I'm still holding out the question of, of wellness. Um, you've spoken of trauma, you've spoken of chance. Um, talk to me about what I don't experience as a white man, which is the existential threat of racism. Uh, growing up in Dallas, how did, that, how did that play out? What was that and how did that play out as a factor for sort of the trauma that your family carried? Yeah, you know, I, I was a child. I, I didn't see 
I, I don't know that I understood what that was about, except for this reality and this challenge of survival, right? This, this sense of presence, right? How would Thurman uh, and Jesus and the disinherited suggest that um, the first question um, that the disinherited uh, woke up with each day, the first question that Jesus woke up with each day uh, as a Jew, as a poor Jew, as a poor Jew growing up in Rome um, was how will I respond to Rome? Right? The first question. And so I think this was the reality. Like this question of survival in the context of oppression is the only way I've come to know it. And so, um, and so there are glimpses of this, but I won't say it's um, people, all the signs that people think about it. Did anyone ever call you the N word? Probably. Um, I don't know. It didn't stick uh, in, in my head. Uh, I. Uh, uh, I went to I went to public schools, uh, magnet schools, uh, uh, most of the time. So I was bused across town uh, to go to school. So I got up a little earlier and had to uh, wait a little later to get home uh, to start my homework. Um, but that also meant that I went to um, I went I got exposed to bar mitzvahs from friends of mine uh, who were uh, who I went to fourth through sixth grade with as they went into middle school and experienced their homes in different kinds of ways. Um, the fact that I had to do that to get the education that was in North Dallas, so that was across town, is an experience of systemic uh, and structural racism, of course. Um, this sense of survival, uh, where I understood my brother to be wrestling with whether he could protect himself uh, in our community, uh, and what that meant um, is a sense of him being locked out of those opportunities because structurally, um, the reality is we fund schools based upon th the security, the safety, the books, and the opportunities of field trips based upon um, uh, 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 taxes that are tied to housing. Um, and so they weren't uh, as much in our community as in others. Um, my first experience actually though, uh, with this acute nature of the realities of racism with the kinds of spaces where we think of it today and policing and the like, I actually came in New Orleans where I went to college. I went to Xavier University, a historically black college, um, the only historically black and Catholic institution in the United States, only institution in the US founded by a saint, um, St. Catherine Drexel. Mm -hmm. um, I'm proud of my school if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> um, and there in my first year as the class president, uh, for my freshman class. I went to the first party of the year uh, outside. The freshmen were going. Uh, it was actually sponsored by the fraternity I'm now a member of. Uh, and ended up being in the case that one of my classmates who came with me from Dallas, remember, we went to church together, Beth Eden Baptist Church, um, had an interaction with police who decided to take him off and away from everyone else around the corner from the place where the party was where no one else could see him. And I was thinking about what is my mom gonna say if something happened to Jay and I was here. And so I went around the corner. This, I wouldn't commend this as wise. I went around the corner and I stood there to watch the police interact with him because they took him over there out of sight for some reason. And someone, um, uh, one of the police officers, there were four, um, said, you need to get out of here and let my partner do his job. As he pulled, they didn't have billy clubs at that time. They had these things that looked like antennas. So it was this small on his hip, but when he pulled it out, it was a steel rod, I guess it was. Um, and I said, 18-year-old Starsky said, I'm just making sure that your, your, your partner's job doesn't interfere with my partner's rights. Not why. But it was public enough. I expanded the circle enough. And people began to pay attention enough that either they were going to beat both of us in front of everybody or they were going to tamp it down and take us to jail. They tamped it down and they took us to jail, but not without allowing us to sit in front of the party where everyone was in line, in handcuffs, um, in front of everyone, uh, not something you want the class president, not exactly the projection you want from the class president either. Um, but that's where I began to experience what this looked like. 
what this was really like as a young adult and what we were up against. And the reality is, in the year that I went to Xavier, the year that I went to Xavier, 1994, uh, New Orleans was the murder capital of the United States of America. It was known for police violence. And my story could have ended that day, that night. And that reality yeah. is when I came to understand my own kind of limitations and finitude, reflecting over the course of that night when the dean of students was trying to find us uh, in the system of lockup yeah. um, to have us appropriately liberated. Uh, was when I began to see what the real deal was for me uh, as a young black person in America. Well, I, I wanted to spend some time talking about you and your family before we talk about children, okay. because you can't really talk about children without talking about families yeah. and the realities and the challenges that children are born into and, and the expectation, the hope, really the expectation the society has that if you're going to be successful in life, you have to be uh, successful at school. You have to be successful uh, later on, uh, you know, with jobs. You've got to be successful in all these different things. It's it's an intensely competitive world. And as you know, um, uh, Charlotte is a is a place that's 50 out of 50 in terms of economic mobility. Yeah. It, and it is a, it's a city uh, that uh, the McKinsey Global Report said is going to get um, two-thirds of all jobs uh, over the next, you know, um, 10 years, uh, one of 10 cities. So, you know, let, I think this, this juxtaposition of Americans' families, foreign vulnerable families, and the, the detail, this was just your family. Right, and every family's different, yeah. but to appreciate all the different layers of of experience in the family, um, and to and to look at it, you know, from the standpoint of family wellness mm -hmm. and how well our families are, is obviously a massive predictor of what's going to happen when a kid goes to school which is a massive predictor of what's going to happen when they either stay in school or not stay in school, which is going to be a massive predictor of what's going to happen to children and families in Charlotte as Charlotte continues to grow and there is at risk of, because we already know about the 50 out of 50, of a growing divide, you yeah. see. And why, are we, why do we care? Because we're Christians. And we have a, a ministry to children that Jesus has called us to do yeah. in Matthew. So yeah. let's talk about children. Let's just, some highlights here. Uh, the child population, 73 million children in America. How many of those children, as a percentage, would you consider to be, uh, or whatever words you would use? Let's talk about the words. Yeah. What would you use to describe children that we might call uh, under-resourced, disadvantaged. What, what, what's the language you like to use? Yeah, so we use, we use an arbitrary, I like using the word poor, uh, even though it's insufficient, right? Poverty has much more to do with um, a holistic set of circumstances than it does have to do with economics, but, uh, but we've got to have something concrete to work with. And so we're just talking about people who live below the par poverty line in America, uh, which is in and of itself an arbitrary measure. Um, so that's first to say, but one in seven children in America, about uh, 10.5 million pre-pandemic, uh, lived in poverty. Um, that's one thing, right, just say one in seven. Uh, but then we start kind of lifting that back and say, when you look at African-American children, you're talking about one in four, one in five. Look at Hispanic children, you're talking about one in five. Uh, so, so here we're talking about an inequity among those who live in poverty. This is another important thing to talk about, though. Um, so the 20... Uh, uh, the uh, 2019 figures, what you see there, best available for that report, which came out, our State of America Children Report, CDF has been putting out for 30 years uh, to give a comprehensive picture of the reality for uh, America's rising future, which is one of the ways I like to think about it. Uh, but we work really for both children under the age of 18 
um, and youth, those who are under the age of 25. And I make this point because uh, as we think about this, there are 74 million in 2020, 74 million people under the age of 18 in America. Um, there are another 30 million who are between 18 and 25, which means this is the largest generational segment of the American populace. There are more people in this generation than in any other. Uh, this is also the most diverse. Uh, 2020 was the first time in American history where the majority of those under the age of 18 were children of color. Uh, that has been the case uh, for uh, children under the age of five uh, since about 2011. Uh, so the reality is this disproportionality of poverty, um, the fact that Hispanic children are 10 times more likely to live in food insecure homes, uh, so this disproportionality of poverty, this disproportionality of hunger, this disproportionality of life in risk is the reality for America's future because this is actually now the majority of the rising population. So this has critical implications for what it means to be American, for what it means for concepts like the American dream. Critical to the American dream was this idea of social mobility, the capacity for one to do better than your parents, right? You work hard, you defer gratification, um, um, you educate yourself, you can do better from your parents. Um, for millennials, that proves not to be true. Uh, this is Generation Z I was just talking about, under 25. They have entered the workforce. Some of you manage them, like I do. We will pray for one another. <laughs> mm -hmm. Millennials, the oldest of which, some call them ex are 40, 42. Been in the workforce for a while, right? Um, and, and, you know, youngest of them uh, around, uh, now around uh, 27, 20, 28, right? Um, millennials, the most educated generation in American history, because they've grown up with these kinds of um, absolute kind of distractive interventions, um, disruptions, a pandemic, disruption, 911, disruptions, racial reckoning, disruptions, great recession. Because they've grown up in that context, they actually will not do as well as their parents. And so that is one element, one pillar of the concept of the American dream that is not yet, that is not true. They are the voices in Langston Hughes', Langston Hughes poem, Let America Be America Again, this long, beautiful poem that has this recurring refrain, America never was America to me. That concept is not true for, for a whole generation that is now in the workforce. And what you were telling me, and what Raj Chetty's work from Harvard about economic mobility tells us, is that in Charlotte, as in St. Louis, we were 42nd on that list, hmm. is that in these, these metropolitan areas, the idea of social mobility, doing better than your parents, may not be able to be true. What then of the idea of America, if hard work, for gratification, education, cannot have me do better than my parents. And I grew up in a generation that has proven at least one element of this rule not to be true. Is Charlotte not American? Now we have to trouble, and maybe it's a great opportunity to recreate, to resurrect another ideal of what it means to be in community with one another. It maybe has more to do with personhood and with wellness. Maybe the marks are more of healing than they are economic advancement. Maybe it's about capacity to sit with one another in mutuality than to see one another vis-a-vis -vis the other, right? Growing up in the 80s meant also the rat race. Uh, you don't want to remember those hairstyles. You don't want to remember that fashion but you perhaps recall this concept of the rat race. It was this rugged pursuit of getting ahead. I grew up watching that. I knew that because I saw it even as a 10 and 12 year old. Maybe the pandemic becomes for us a resetting, a portal, an opportunity of passing through a collective death to a resurrection that has us to live more peaceably with one another, with less angst 
and to respond to the trauma in the other with an opportunity for healing. That's a hope for me. It is a prayer for me. Because all of these, the indicators going into the pandemic were also not strong for these children. Um, in December of 2019, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation uh, came out with a report on suicide. As a father of three young black boys, um, it stayed with me that the highest spiking category of suicide was among black boys. That there was a suicide epidemic in the black community pre-pandemic. Let me say that differently. There was a suicide epidemic among black and brown children before they were dislocated from their schools in mass. Before they became isolated on the screens that we just that we were fighting to keep them away from before the pandemic, <laughs> before they were pulled away from the nurture of teachers who care so much for them, and before they were pulled out of vacation Bible schools and Sunday school classrooms all across America, before their routine was disrupted. All of these things are actually fissures. Uh, and fractures of the network of social and emotional wellness. And prior to that, we had them wrestling what it, what it meant to hold on to hope. And so our work now has to be uh, wrapping loving arms around creating context of social stability uh, and care uh, so that we might get to wholeness and healing or something um, that looks like it on the other side. So tell me about how Children's Defense Fund is engaging that work. Uh, let's talk about freedom schools, for example. A uh, little background, and what are your hopes there? Because that's something that we have been involved in here, and we want to get more engaged in. Say something about, uh, about freedom schools. Yeah, warning. Um, freedom schools is how I got involved with the Children's Defense Fund. Uh, you could be the next president, uh, those of you who are going to read aloud. Mm -hmm. um, Freedom Schools is an uh, uh, out-of-school time, uh, culturally responsive intervention uh, that's operating in 30 states, uh, more than 100 American cities, uh, providing children with not only opportunities to engage in literacy development, but also providing young adults with leadership development. Those classrooms are run by college-age students all across the country who uh, learn about education, learn about movement, learn about children's policy, even before they come into those classrooms. And they are transformed by the experience as well. Um, Say something about the history. I think most people don't appreciate why Freedom Schools yeah. came into existence. Yeah, so if you think about the 1960s uh, and the Civil Rights Movement uh, and era, a Freedom Summer in Mississippi, uh, when volunteers were coming in from across the country to engage in voter registration uh, there in Mississippi, they realized that they had to provide uh, some caring support for children while they had conversations with parents or while parents volunteered uh, to go door to door to register people to vote. Uh, and so they created Charles Cobb Jr., who was a preacher's kid, by the way. His father, Charles Cobb, uh, was a pastor uh, within uh, what is now the United Church of Christ. Uh, and, um, and he began to look at um, resources and developed a concept whereby um, they would have these schools to teach literacy uh, and teach citizenship uh, to young people um, there uh, as a part of Mississippi Freedom Summer uh, implemented by student, the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee uh, and advanced and supported uh, by the National Council of Churches. Um, so this is church work from its very beginning. Uh, and then they were renewed in the 1990s. Uh, Mayor Wright Edelman, as, again, as a part of this Black Community Crusade for Children, uh, began to plant the first Freedom School, was actually in, uh, in South Carolina, uh, then began to expand uh, in my uh, former state of Missouri, uh, in Kansas City, in, a, in the largest network and concentration of Freedom Schools, which was in Kansas City, all planted in churches. Um, so this is, in so many ways, a part of our ministry uh, with and for children in America. What happens in an average Freedom School Day? Freedom School Day begins with Harambe, uh, uh, from the key Swahili word, which means let's pull together. 
uh, gathering together uh, where children sing, dance, celebrate. Um, most uh, importantly, uh, they sing about the, uh, uh, in the Christian hymn, it's uh, something within, right? There's something within that holdeth the rain, there's something within that, right? We, we know this. In freedom schools, it's something inside so strong. Mm. Um, and so talking about the importance of their own agency, the South African uh, song that they have uh, come and we've in integrated into Harambe. It's but alive. I, that it, song is alive. Oh, yeah. It, it, it lives in and among us. Um, some of the best pictures of me and Ms. Zettelman and Death together are jumping up and down, uh, singing, <laughs> uh, s singing something that sounds so strong. Yeah. Uh, I won't tell you who leaped higher, um, uh, me or her. Um, <laughs> But it begins there, uh, there's an opportunity for volunteers and guests to read aloud, which gives young people exposure uh, to people that they may not see otherwise. In our Freedom Schools in St. Louis, the mayor, the, the president of the Board of Aldermen would come and read, and then young people have the opportunity to ask them questions about uh, what they're doing, who they are, how they became who they are. Uh, and then after that period, which includes announcements, we transition uh, into uh, a period of our integrated reading curriculum. Uh, uh, intentionally curated uh, curriculum of, uh, of uh, readings and stories that are age appropriate, grade level appropriate for young people, but also that allow them to see themselves in the books, see themselves to, to turn on their interest in ways that they all, don't always see, especially for black and brown children. Uh, and then there's dear time, uh, drop everything and read. Um, and of course, I've taken that into my household, so I've seen other people do it as well. I have to do it. I have three boys. They like to be connected. They like these devices. Uh, give me some dear time is, is my call. Um, and so we end up with uh, Drop Everything and Read, where young people can choose anything that they like to read. Uh, and then, of course, after a nourishing meal and opportunities, in the afternoon time, we have uh, various types of cultural enrichment. Um, and that may be partnerships with people from throughout uh, the community. Uh, for us in St. Louis, it included a partnership with a local PBS affiliate to do a STEM curriculum. Uh, it, it included making sure that once a week, because it was a summer curriculum, young people went and had the opportunity to swim. Uh, it included uh, cultural realities and supports, people who taught African drum. And this becomes a different thing in different communities, but what it does more than anything else, it, it unlocks, it enlivens um, the, the, the love of reading in young people. And of course, if you can read, you can do uh, anything and learn of anything else. Um, the other thing is that it does is it closes opportunity gaps uh, for young people. Uh, we had a partnership with three school districts in the St. Louis community for our Freedom Schools. Uh, and we were pleased to be able to come back to the superintendents every summer uh, where the superintendents gave credit. If a young person needed to go to summer school, they could get credit for coming to our Freedom School. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we took pleasure in showing the superintendent in the school district at the end of the year that the students who came to the Freedom School advanced their reading more than the ones who went to summer school because there's something about an environment that affirms not only your literacy, your leadership, but also your capacity and your agency that you can make a difference in yourself, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, in your nation, and in your world, which that social action engagement, I talk about it more, it's that citizenship teaching mm -hmm. is also a part of it. And I think that's, again, I, I'm wrapped up in this idea of America. I think it reclaims what public schools were at their origin, which was not workforce development. Public schools in American history were established to develop and nurture an educated citizenry. Because the last thing anyone wants is an ignorant voter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you choose, public schools was to make sure that by the time you get to choose, You've got good information, and you've been formed as a citizen for the nation that we want to be. Mm -hmm. And so a top line and a bottom line on Freedom Schools is that they make for a better nation of citizens mm -hmm. everywhere we have contact with children and young people. To read the report is, uh, is very humbling, and I think to know of the, these immense challenges post-COVID uh, can be overwhelming uh, for us. You've just given a beautiful uh, vision. What keeps you going? What keeps you, you know, I would encourage everybody to read the report. It's 86 pages. 
but it breaks down every possible thing, much of which you may not know or imagine, that stand in the way of opportunity for children. Uh, what keeps you going in the face of your own personal experience, in your work as a pastor of a church, as an activist, as a, a leader now leading an organization to embrace kids and families, um, knowing that we, you know, we can't do all this work in our lifetime. What keeps you going? Um, the reality of our pluralistic settings in America, I haven't been asked this question before, especially in this role, I would normally tell people, um, and in a moment that wasn't after this morning, I would tell you that what keeps me going is the reality of my own children, um, my responsibility as a father, and the reality that I know that no matter what I offer for them, um, context, challenges, um, can take those things away. But today, um, the catechism keeps me going. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? without a sense of the transcendent, without a sense of a hope that is wholly other than these circumstances, I could feel this work in vain. I believe that our sense of the possible in the social sector is informed deeply in the Western world by our theologies and our faith. I come from a different place than Mrs. Oaks in different circumstances. And in some sense, probably a different element or aspect, a different accent mark on my Christian faith. But I actually don't think this work could have been sustained incarnate in her for two generations were it not for that faith. And I don't think it's sustainable for another generation unless we're digging into exploring, unearthing the resources of faith make it possible. There is no hope for America's children without something that is wholly other and greater than the idea of America. And so it is that faith that keeps me going. And and I say that with deep gratitude for what we spoke about before, which is the power of the gathering around the table, which changes my answer today and makes it more true. So actually when your uh, predecessor was here, Dr. Baron Wright Edelman, we went through a lot of statistics. And I said, what do you say to people when they say, well, this, is very, this has been a very interesting hour. <laughs> We've learned a lot about statistics and about, you know, all this kind of thing. She, she looked out and she said, I am not here to entertain you. I am here to ask you to join me. And it will be up to you and your Lord to decide together whether you will join me. And I want you to know, sir, we have joined you. We are with you. 
and I can promise you that we're going to do everything we can to use the full force of our resources and our capital, social and financial, to invest in children in this city. And we look forward to continuing partnership with you. And our faith is strengthened by your presence and by your witness. And we hope that our determination will also be a source of encouragement to you and to the, all the beautiful, courageous people of the Children's Defense Fund who day in and day out do this incredibly important work. And I praise God for you, and I thank you. Thanks, and we God. all thank you. Thanks,